Hey, hey, everyone. We are getting ready to go live with Shay. We're going to talk about her journey of starting volleyball in middle school and then learning mental toughness over all these years to become the elite setter that she is now committed to playing college. Shay will be joining us shortly. Went for her to hop on. There she is. Hi, Shay. All right, hey everybody joining. Shapers gonna be joining us shortly. Waiting for her to hop on. Hoping these invite works. Here we go. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Avery. Shay Britt be joining us shortly. She's gonna talk about her mental toughness journey from playing middle school B team, now playing her senior year of high school and club volleyball. Let's see. And here she is. Hopefully this works. Yes. Instagram just wants to give me the hardest time. Go live. Wait, check. Hey, everybody. Give us just a second. Instagram's giving me a hard time here. Everybody, just give us a moment as we're joining live here. Wait, there she is. It's time to brush your teeth. That's my Alexa kicks in. Hey, Shay, what's up? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Wait for, uh, say, my sound to work properly. All right. All right, we're going to go and get started. Shay, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How are you? Doing awesome. Excited to have you here. Uh, we've been talking for a couple weeks now, getting ready for this. Um, yes. We're going to go ahead and jump into it then. All right. So, Shay, um, take us back to your very first volleyball practice in middle school. Um, what even hooked you on the sport of volleyball? Why volleyball? Well, um, I was in fifth grade, and I had a friend named Malia. And she had actually played for A5, which is like the number one ranked club in Georgia. And she kind of introduced like our whole friend group to volleyball. And I was like, okay, I was looking for a sport to do. So I was like, okay, why not volleyball? So she kind of like in PE, she kind of practiced with me, you know, just little. We weren't very good, but um, she practiced with me in PE. And then tryouts came and we both made the team. And I actually remember my first day of practice. Um, I was terrible. I couldn't even. I couldn't even underhand serve. I couldn't set. I couldn't pass to save my life. It was honestly terrible. But I do owe a lot of my like volleyball career to her because she really got me started on it. So I thank her for a lot of that. That's awesome. <laughs> so thinking back to that middle school BT, you can't even underhand serve the ball. Did you think you would ever be where you are now? I mean, you're, you're committed to play in college. You're a great setter. I've, I've seen you play. We've all seen your videos. Things like that. Did you ever imagine you'd be where you are Not today? Not at all. I mean, being that young and knowing I wasn't good and honestly just like seeing my peers like accelerate and I really wasn't um, kind of made me like, okay, maybe volleyball is just not for me. Um, but then I just kept working and kept working and eventually kind of outworked the people who didn't want it as bad and kind of just got to where I am, which I'm thankful I did. And I'm thankful I didn't give up on it because I would not be where I am today without that. So, yeah. So, so what, what kept you going? I mean, you were, you're clearly frustrated at some times feeling like you weren't really good at it. So why even keep going? I know a lot of people who would just quit. They're like, man, I suck at this. I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like the reason I kept going was just because volleyball became kind of like my outlet for everything. So anything that was going on at home, at school, with friends, with family, like if I just went to the court and went and played volleyball, it was kind of like reality went away for two hours. And that's where I got to let out my anger and my frustration and all that. So I think that's what really motivated me to keep going. And still to this day, whenever I'm having a bad day, I'm just like, okay, I just need to go play volleyball and my day will get better. So that's really what kept me going. Yeah, I 
definitely feel that there are so many times where it's just a it's a day it's a day. i'm like well at least i have volleyball <laughs> at least i have volleyball to look for and it's like as soon as i step in that gym nothing else matters so i love that so let's jump right into this like you talk a lot about mental toughness and your whole journey and you've been resilient and all those things like how do you define mental toughness and what does that mean to you um i don't know if i could give a clear like definition of what mental toughness is but i just think it's the ability to stay calm and cool and collected on the court because obviously emotions are high and i think volleyball is a very mental game more than it is a physical game because it's a game of mistakes and it's a game of making mistakes or winning points so you know one's good one's bad but they both happen and I think mental toughness is all about just battling like and finding how you can handle making mistakes and coming back together for your team because you're not playing for yourself. And that's something I had to learn. I had to learn to not be selfish and I had to learn how to play for my team. Mm -hmm. And that honestly, my mental toughness a lot. So. Yeah. Some couple of really good points here. Uh, first, I want to ask, like, was there ever a time where you weren't mentally tough, where it was, just wasn't natural for you, or you just all kind of were you always just naturally mentally tough? No, I was, it never came easy, and it still doesn't come very easy. I still have to work at it. I'm not perfect at it whatsoever. But my first year of club, I ha I had the worst attitude on my team. I mean, it was it was so bad, it was embarrassing, and I would just get so frustrated with myself, and I get so angry because I felt like every time I made a mistake. I was letting my team down and I would get frustrated, but to everybody else, it just looked like I was being a selfish player. But in reality, I was just like kind of embarrassed and ashamed that I made those mistakes and I costed points for my team. And yeah, yeah that was pretty much how it happened. That's, that's a really good point there because a lot of players, most players probably do put a lot of pressure on themselves, especially and make a mistake. They're like, oh, I'm letting my team down. I'm letting my coaches down. Maybe I'm letting my parents down. Like, what it, now that you've kind of worked through a lot of it, what are you telling yourself now when you're making mistakes? You're like, do you feel that same pressure? I can't believe I let my teammates down, or are you just processing it differently? How's that look? I think I still feel that. I don't want to say embarrassment, but it kind of is embarrassment. I still feel that every time I make a point, because you also have people watching in the stands. You have your team, you have your coach, you know. But I just tell myself, and my mom actually helped me with this. She came up with the phrase, okay, next play or next point. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that point that I just – the mistake I just made, that's in the past. And so I got to look forward now because I'm never getting that point back. Like, it's never coming back. That's already happened. So I she just taught me to focus on the next point, meaning, okay, get my mind right, get my attitude right, and lock in and go for the next ball. So. Yeah, that's really good. Um, when you – so it's easy to feel like – you know, we have a lot of pressure from our teammates. Do you feel like your teammates were actually putting that pressure on you, or do you feel that's something you kind of put on yourself, like, I feel like my teammates, I'm letting them down. They're actually okay. They're showing me grace. Or were they actually really aggressive and rude? I've always been blessed with really good teammates, and they never put that kind of pressure on me. It was almost – it was just a me problem, honestly. I just put so much pressure on myself that I was like, my teammates are going to be so mad at me. I'm making mistakes. But – in reality, they're not because they make as many mistakes as I do. Yeah, that's a very good call out because I know that so many young athletes especially feel that pressure like, oh, yeah, I am letting my teammates down. But really, if they ask their teammates, their teammates are like, it's okay. I get it. Like, they, they, there's so much grace that our teammates give us that we don't really give ourselves. And that's really where a lot of that pressure comes from. It's, it's more of ourselves than our our coaches and our um, our teammates and even our parents at times. So that's a really good call out there. Um, you had mentioned that your mom has been in your corner. Uh, she's kind of giving you those pep talks like next ball, next ball. Talk about, you know, that relationship with your mom, starting with that middle school B team where you feel like, oh, I suck at this. Like, what is she telling you during these times of, like, middle school B team? Well, she's always been my best friend and, like, somebody I can always confide in. And I, we call her – um opal the optimist because she's very optimistic she's always looking for the bright side she's always got something positive to say so i know if i didn't have her in my corner like cheering me on and helping me like, throughout all these years from sixth grade up i would be nowhere close to where i am now and she's just always been the one to kind of encourage me not get not get frustrated at me not get on to me for how i play because I don't have to play to a certain standard for her. All she just wants me to do is to have a good attitude and to have fun. And so she always helps keep things positive, even when I'm not. So 
that is awesome. I love that. I think she's actually watching right now. So hi, mom. <laughs> Glad you're here. Um, so let's talk about times when you kind of are feeling overwhelmed or anxious in a match. Like, what is what is your what do you do? What is your thing? How do you deal with that anxiety, that that feeling of distress and feeling overwhelmed? What do you do? Honestly, I feel that a lot. I feel it before games. I feel it during games. I feel it all the time. But usually when I get that feeling, I kind of just pray. Even if I don't close my eyes, if I don't have time to close my eyes, I kind of just have a conversation with the Lord in my head. And I'm just like, all right, give me peace. Give me wisdom. Give me strength to finish the game. And he kind of blessed me through that. So that's how I kind of combat that anxiety and overwhelming yeah, let, feeling. Yeah, that's really good. Let's talk about kind of expanding on that a little bit. Moments of pressure in a match. Let's say it's like you're you're losing like uh, 22, 24. You're up serving. Like, how do you get focused, get that confidence? Like, how do you do that? I actually, funny story that you say that. I That was, I think... I think that was the score of our um, Sweet 16 game, and I was serving. Wow. We ended up losing, but um, I just – every time I'm serving game point, whether it's theirs or ours, I kind of just take my time going back to the line, and I do my serving routine, and I just take as long as I can. I think you get eight seconds before you can serve. So I kind of just take as long as I can, and I say a few words out loud, you know, like whether it's a prayer or it's like – usually what I say is, Lord, bless these feet, these hands, these fingers in my mind. And that kind of is just what gets me going. And then I served the ball. So I love that. I love that. Um, I think I started a new routine this year. I don't. I, I haven't played since like June, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember what it is. But it's like, you know, I'm like I, I hit the ball, I breathe, I go one, two, three in my head. I don't know, like or three, two, one, three, two, one, and like I don't know why counting down. It works for me in a lot of areas where I'm just like three, two, one. It's like it's mentally it's making myself just like, here we go. I don't know why that works for me, but I think it is important to have a routine, whatever it looks like. You is talking for me, whatever. It's, it's smacking the ball, breathing, and counting down. So I, I do think that is important to have, especially when you get to high-pressure situations, whether you're down 22, 24, or something like that, to be able to just – maintain the routine because that routine is what brings that confidence and just being comfortable in that pressure moment. And it also keeps you calm too, which is good in those high intensity. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, all those who are watching, feel free to ask questions to Shay or myself as we're going along here. Type them in the questions. We'll try to answer them. Uh, but speaking of routines, we did have a question come in earlier. What is your pregame routine look like? Okay. Usually my pregame routine is listening to music and eating food and getting hype with my teammates in the locker room because I'm not usually one to like go by myself, like put my headphones on and be in the corner. That just doesn't really work for me. And I know a lot of my friends do that, but that's just not for me. I like to go in the locker room and put the speaker on and play music and just go have fun with my teammates and just enjoy it because to me that's just what gets me hype and gets me excited for my games. That's awesome. And how long have you had that routine? Is that just something that's kind of new? Or have you been doing that for a few years and you figured that's what's working for you? Honestly, I just feel like it started at my old school, my freshman year. Um, I made varsity and at my old school, that's all we did. We went in the locker room, we put the um, speaker on and we all just had fun and we danced and we sang and just got ready for our game. And that just all got us excited and like kind of pumped up and gave us a little bit of adrenaline. So I think that's kind of where I learned it from. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, I think one of the funny things you talk about sometimes, you posted a video about this maybe a couple weeks ago, that you were told that you're too short to play front row. And I know oftentimes as, as a coach, you know, you do want that bigger right side or bigger center for the sake of the block, but you play all the way around and you're, how tall are you? Five, four? Five, four, four? Okay. So talk about, talk about that uh, journey, because I, I imagine you haven't always been able to or allowed to play front row. Um, I usually hate the word no, and so when I get told no, I come to, like, take it as a challenge. So when I got told that I could never play front row, I was like, okay, well, watch this. So I worked my butt off, and I got faster, and I worked my vertical, and I got it up as high as I could. I'm still working on that, actually. And I started doing blocking drills. I tried to get any training that I could because I was just so determined. I just, 
I don't know what it is. I just love proving people wrong. So I get like a feeling of satis satisfaction when I do. So honestly, blocking has probably become my favorite thing now in volleyball, other than setting, because I'm a setter. <laughs> blocking to me is just so much fun because it's just a little short me and I get to go up at the net and block. Um, but yeah. I bet you have such joy, even if it just clips your fingers, it's like, yes. <laughs> I got it. So you talk about you don't like saying no. Um, how does that kind of criticism fuel you? How does that motivate you? Like, how does it feel like when you're just proving these people wrong? It honestly makes me even more excited to keep going. I feel like that could also, like, backtrack to our other question, like, what makes me keep going is when I keep getting told no. And that happened to me a lot my freshman year, my eighth grade year. Um, even my sophomore year, I got told no a lot. I couldn't do things or I was benched and I didn't start, whatever that was. And that kind of just motivated me. I was like, okay, I'm going to prove you wrong and I'm going to work harder and you're going to see that. So mm -hmm. I kind of that so they could never tell me no again. Obviously, I still get told no sometimes, but I wanted to make it where it was really hard for them to say no to not let me go front row. Yeah. Awesome. We we did have a question come in from Avery. Have you ever had a coach who drained you mentally? And if so, how did you work through it? That's a great question, Avery. That's a good question. Yes, I did have a coach that did drain me mentally. Um, at first, it was really hard to work through because I kind of felt like, you know, her being older than me and me being um, her athlete. Like, I obviously, there's a level of respect there, but when it turns into disrespect, then it's like, okay, well, something's got to change. So I kind of talked to my mom about it, and she really helped me through it. And I honestly debated on quitting, and she was like, you're not quitting, um, which I'm very grateful for because if I did quit, I don't – who knows where I'd be right now. But um, I kind of combated that through – and I don't know if this works for everybody, but for me, I have a strong relationship with the Lord. And I just started praying for her, and I was like, okay, I need to work on my stuff. She needs to work on her stuff. So I'm going to pray for her, and I'm going to pray for myself. And eventually he blessed that, and he worked our relationship out. And obviously that's not going to be the case for everybody, but I kind of just had to say, like, what she said. I had to put it in one ear and out the other, and I couldn't let it bother me because, you know, like the underhanded comments or, like, the derogatory, like, comments like people make or coaches make at you, you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt because mm – -hmm. Number one, they're trying to help you, but sometimes it's not always out of trying to help. Um, so you just kind of kind of combat that however you can. Yeah, that's really good. You say kind of take it with a grain of salt, and that's something that comes up a lot when I'm just having conversations with athletes. It's like listen to what, what the coach is saying, not necessarily how they're saying it, exactly. um, because coach, coaches are also very competitive, yeah. and their emotions run high as well and we yell a lot <laughs> and it's mostly out of love you know and passion for the game but it's you know a lot of younger players less experienced players kind of take it personally like oh they're yelling at me and it's like they're not yelling at you they're just yelling because they're passionate and it's, listen to what they're saying not how they're saying it and then just process it objectively it's what they're saying does it actually make sense or are they off the rocker? Because sometimes coaches do say crazy things that don't make sense. So just kind of processing it objectively and be like, okay, I, I understand what they're saying now, and I can see how that applies to what I need to work on. Awesome. So you have talked about being a training machine, training like five days a week, I believe, uh, begging your parents for extra practice time. Um, where did this relentless determination come from? And, <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Honestly, it was probably my freshman year of club season. I got um, – my eighth grade year of club was my first year starting club, and I was a starting setter, and we ran a 6-2. Well, then I switched clubs, and my freshman year, I made the 15s team, and I was benched, and I barely ever got to go in, and I was like, okay, I absolutely hate this feeling, and so from then on, I would always come to practice early, or I'd stay later, or I'd get lessons with the director of, our, of my club at the time, and I was just like, I, once again, I hate being told no, so I was like, I want to prove them wrong, and I want to be better, so she can't tell me no, and she has no choice but to play me. So I asked for lessons. My dad actually got me signed up with um, a guy named Brent, and he's helped me a lot. Um, 
and I also have some other setting coaches that I went to like during that time and that's what really helped me to get where I am now but being told no and not getting to play like really fueled me into becoming who I am now. That's awesome. Um, with that much work that you have put into it, were there ever moments where you're like, is it even worth it? Is all of this effort worth it? Yeah, there's definitely moments like that. And I was going back to my freshman year, I was working my tail off and I still never got to start or really ever got to play. And I didn't get rewarded for that hard work until my sophomore year. And that was really hard, like being in my freshman year and working so hard and I felt like I just wasn't being seen mm. but in reality I just didn't know how it was going to play out um but it played out really well for me the next year and my like training did really pay off but I just couldn't see that in the moment that is so good because there are so many athletes who do feel like they're grinding and grinding and it's really just not their time yet like Maybe there's other players that are just more experienced in high school. Maybe they're just older. And sometimes you have to wait your turn, right? So, like, were there any conversations with coaches? Did you, like, go home and just, like, vent to your mom? Like, what, what were you – how are you coping with this? Um, I did talk to my mom a lot about it. And I talked to the director of my club, too. He was um, a really good mentor to me. And he was just like, the best thing I can tell you to do is just to keep working hard. Even if nobody, nobody else can see your hard work, you know how hard you work and that's going to pay off one day. And he just basically told me not to put, you know, like my worth in what my coach sees, but to mm. be that, that I'm working hard and I'm going to outwork my teammates. Mm. That's really good. That's really good. Uh, we do have another question. Did you always think you would play in college? knew I wanted to play in college but honestly like the more I got into like the recruiting season like the recruiting process I was like okay this is way too difficult I don't even know if I'm even going to get to play in college um but eventually it all worked out and I did which I think a lot of athletes need to hear because the recruiting process is brutal and it's really hard and it's really draining and I know a lot of athletes who get stuck in that recruiting process and quit because it drains them or it's too hard or they don't get noticed, but you kind of got to do it the right way and you got to just stay determined and go find your right fit. Yeah, that's right. I do want to talk to you a little bit more about recruiting later on. Uh, I do have a question about that. There's a really good uh, topic right there. We can dive into a little bit later, um, but you have talked a lot about your mom, uh, how she kind of just played a pivotal role in helping you manage your emotions and kind of, introduce you to like affirmations and meditations and stuff like that talk about when you were when your mom's kind of first introducing you to things like affirmations and meditation did you receive it uh, with open arms or are you kind of reluctant or like i'll just try anything at this point what? like no i'm not doing that that's weird like i don't even know why you would suggest that in the first place and then i tried it and i was like okay wait maybe it actually does work and so then i told her i was like okay maybe you're right but at first i was like no that's just weird and I never heard of it before. And then I kept seeing stuff on social media being like, oh, try affirmations, try this. And I was like, my mom literally just told me this like a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, I actually did a networking, so thanks, mom. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty much the response I get from most athletes about anything. <laughs> I'm suggesting, like, I promise you it works. There's, there's science behind it. There's yeah. a lot of research behind it. And specifically with affirmations, I talked a lot about limiting beliefs last week is – we are training our brains to believe whatever we want them to believe. If we fill them with negative thoughts about ourselves, we tell ourselves we suck, that's what we're going to believe and we're going to act like it. Our behavior will reflect our belief that we suck at whatever. But if we replace those with positive affirmations, say, no, I've got this, or I'm the kind of person who pushes through, uh, I, I will get better, I'm still learning, we start to retrain our brain to believe that, yes, I can do this, and then our behavior starts to reflect that. So I actually love that you did say, yeah, I was very, didn't, wasn't open to it at all because that's where most people are, most especially junior athletes. You don't usually hear professional athletes like, uh, I don't know about that. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, you talk a lot about being a perfectionist. Um, and I know so many, I have, I've, every year I have perfectionists on my team. It's, um, it's the, just how high performers are. They're perfectionists, right? So how do you balance the desire for perfection with just the chaos of volleyball? Yeah. 
Um, that's a tough question, honestly. I still struggle struggle with it a lot because I'm not just a perfectionist in volleyball. I feel like I'm a perfectionist in my life too. Um, but I feel like like in the middle of the chaos, like I just I have to remind myself that even my teammates make mistakes and I make mistakes, and some of those things are out of my control. And that's also another big thing for me. I love to be in control, and being a perfectionist and being in control go hand in hand. And so when I don't have those things, it gets crazy and it gets tough and your mind is going like a million miles a minute. But sometimes I just have to take a deep breath and be like, okay, it's really not that deep. Like, it's okay. I'm just playing volleyball and I'm here to have fun. And that's the root of it all. You just have to remember like in those moments that volleyball is supposed to be fun because if it weren't fun, you shouldn't be doing it. That's absolutely right. If you're not having fun, then you're doing something wrong or you just shouldn't be doing it. Right. Have you? Did you ever have a coach who was like, Yep. Did you know that you're a perfectionist? <laughs> I've gotten told that a lot. Yeah. Gotcha. That's awesome. Um, have there ever been moments, I'm sure there have been, where you had just such a real battle with yourself mentally during a match where you're just beating yourself up and you are your biggest opponent in, in that moment. It's not really what's across the other side of the net. It's, it's you beating yourself up. I can remember my sophomore year, um, we were losing in the game pretty bad, and I had made, like, several mistakes in a row. And it was the first time all season that I had gotten pulled out. My coach had pulled me out because usually I played all the way around. And I can just remember beating myself up about it. Like, after the game, during the game, I, I had the worst attitude about it. And once again, my mom came in to save the day. And she was just like, look, you're going to make mistakes. Like, your teammates are going to make mistakes. Like, it's okay. Like, you can have a bad game. And I think a lot of athletes need to hear that, that you're allowed to have a bad game. And being a perfectionist, you don't always handle that very well because you want to be on your A game 24-7 and you want to be per perfect for your teammates. So sometimes that's just hard to hear. But you're allowed to mess up and you're allowed to have a bad game. But it's important to not let that affect you because not only does it affect you, it affects your whole team. Yeah, that's right. It is okay to have a bad game. Even professional athletes have bad games, and this is what they do for a living. They've been doing it, some of them, 20 years, 30 years, whatever, and they've, they're they still having bad games. They're still messing up. They're still getting in their own head, and they're professionals, right? So that's good. Um, being a perfectionist, sometimes it can be hard to accept criticism. Um has it gotten easier over time to accept criticism? Um, I wouldn't say it's gotten easier. I think I've just learned to handle it better because used to, I think, I would think criticism was like a knock on me or like mm. a knock on me, but it really wasn't. It was just my coaches trying to look out for me and trying to better me. Um, so I think it took me a while to realize like their true meaning behind criticism. And I think not everybody's going to grasp that the first time they play a sport. And I don't think it comes easier, but I think you learn how to handle it better. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I'm like that in my own life. It's not, I still don't enjoy it. <laughs> and I try not to take it personally, but I have. And the more you get it, the more you practice receiving is it does get a little bit easier. For those of you who are just joining us, we got Shay Britt. Feel free to ask any questions to her as we go along. Any questions for me about mental skills? Put them in the chat. Uh, we'll try to answer them for you. All right. So you have had a few different injuries um, in your career, including one recently, uh, I think a couple weeks ago. Um, was that was your arm, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, how, talk about the first time you got injured. Was it your leg? Um, no, it was my shoulder. Shoulder. Actually. Okay. That's what it was. Um, how do you? How, well, first of all, how long were you out from the injury, and how do you? process that mentally well I can my freshman and my sophomore year whenever I hit my shoulder I always felt like this burning sensation in my shoulder mm -hmm. and um my junior year I just transferred to a new school and we were actually doing really well we had a really good team and there was one day in practice um where I missed the ball like I missed a dig mm -hmm. and I got actually this is where mental toughness comes into play I got really angry and I saw the ball like bouncing right in front of me, like where I missed it. And I just reared back and slapped the ball as hard as I could to like bounce it back up because I was so frustrated. Well, when I did that, I heard like a little a pop 
and that was when I like officially tore my labrum um, and it had been hurting for months and I played on it as much as I could and then it kind of just became unbearable and I was like okay I need to get this checked out so we got it checked out and we got some x-rays and I had a labral tear which thank goodness it wasn't a rotator cuff tear because that could have been a lot worse but mm. um, I had a tear in my labrum and I kept playing on it because I was like okay I have no choice but to keep playing um, which was really difficult and it hurt a lot but you know your love for the game kind of overrides like the feeling of being injured so we tried um it's called a prp injection which was like it's kind of like a trial and error um and we tried that and it didn't really work and so i kind of just had to keep playing on it and i was like okay well this is just going to be how it is so i kept going to physical therapy i've been in physical therapy for i want to say like four or five months now I felt like it was it's been a long time um played through my whole high school season with it um I hit front row blocked served everything and really hitting was like where it hurt the most but like I said you love for the game kind of overrides like the feeling of pain yeah. um so then my um my my, my senior year was done and then I got into a car accident where I shattered my wrist basically um, and now I'm out for my um, whole club season, so I'm kind of restarting, like, the whole mental toughness thing again. Um, but I'd say, like, for my labrum, at first it was really hard because I was like, okay, this really sucks. Like, the one thing I want to do, I can't do right now. And I just had to give my shoulder a break, which was really hard for me to grasp because I don't like taking breaks. You know, I love to be like, go, go, go all the time. And um, that really just kind of my coaches and my parents really helped me with like set like encouraging me and being like it's not gonna be like this forever and you're gonna get through it and you're not gonna feel stuck forever. Um, you're gonna get past it and you're gonna get better and you're gonna get back to playing how you usually play. Um, so I feel like that really helped me. And if I didn't have teammates, then it would be a lot different. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so I actually didn't realize you were out for the whole club season. <laughs> that is. Not the whole club season, but um, they projected it would be about, like, three months before I can, like, fully play again. Um, mm -hmm. And three months of no practicing or no really setting or anything. So I wouldn't really be back in the groove yet. But I'm praying maybe I can play a few practices or a tournament or so. Yeah, will you still be going to practices between now and then? I will. Uh, yeah, can't. yeah. Um, has anyone have you heard about using visualization or mental rehearsal to help um, continue training while you're injured? Yes, my mom actually introduced me to that as well. Yeah. Um, shout out, mom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, introduced me to that, and I was hesitant about it first, and I was like, okay, what is this like magic that you're coming up with? Like, obviously, it doesn't work. Well, I was proven wrong again, and it, it does pretty much work. And she kind of, like, showed me how to do that and was just, like, telling me, like, visualize you hitting and setting and serving, like, how you'd want it to play out. And, yeah, that's what kind of helped me in my game. Yeah, I, I personally love visualization. It can be – that's one of the tougher ones to get people to buy into, athletes to get to buy into. But I love the way our brain works because our brain, if you do it right, your brain thinks you're actually – our brain can't tell the difference between what we see in our head and what we actually do. And there are times when I'm doing mental rehearsal and, like, my arms are twitching and my legs are twitching because my brain thinks I'm doing it because it's still – firing the same neurons in my brain as if I were actually doing it. Now, it doesn't completely replace physically doing the skill, of course, and physically practicing, but it is such a great, I guess, supplement, especially if you don't have the option to be practicing at, you know, 100%. So I love that <laughs> uh, you get to do that. Um, so why do you think so many athletes, especially junior athletes, are afraid to be honest about their, their mental struggles? Um, okay, that one's kind of tough. I yeah. think I think a lot of them are afraid to be, like, upfront and honest about it is because I think they don't know how people are going to react, like their coaches or their parents or if they're going to believe them or not or, you know, like, whatever they have to say. Um, 
I think it's a struggle for a lot of people, and I think a lot of people don't voice that, and they kind of keep it in, and which is not good because then it's just all. And I had to learn that the hard way. But um, I think it's also a part of the fact, like a lot of us athletes, maybe not want to be perfectionists, but you know, want to have like a certain front about us. So we never look sad, never look upset. Um, like our body language is always good, and sometimes that's not the case. And sometimes I think people don't have the right person to talk to, or like I said, they're too scared to talk to them about it, um, which there's no reason to be. I mean, if you find like a trusted adult um, that you can go to, that's always good. And I found that, which has been really helpful for me. So. Yeah, that's awesome. It, uh, having that support makes a huge difference. Finding someone that you can talk to about it right. um, and w without, without judgment, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. whoever it is you find is like, they're not going to judge you for it, especially if it's an adult. They're like, they, they've been through life. They know how difficult life is. They have that empathy and experience. Like, I'm not, no, they're not here to judge you. And I think that's important because I think a lot of junior athletes kind of feel a shame and embarrassment. They're like, oh, I should be better than this. I shouldn't have to need help, right? But that's not what it's about. Like, literally everyone <laughs> is, is struggling with something, and but no one wants to talk about it. But if we everyone talked about it, it would be so much easier. <laughs> exactly. It's good to talk about your emotions and your feelings and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's important that junior athletes uh, acknowledge it. It's, it's a, emotions are good, right? Emotions are not bad. It's okay to have emotions. It's okay to be emotional, right? The only time emotions can become bad, I guess, is when they kind of control our behavior and there's kind of negative, like you go, punch a wall or, you know, throw a chair across the, <laughs> the court or something like that. That's a little bit different, but emotions, there's nothing wrong with emotions. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's good. Um, let's go back to talking about your college recruitment process. We're going to dive a little bit more into that. Um, and we actually, uh, Avery just kind of had a question tied into it. Do you have any tips on emailing college coaches? I never know what oh. to send. So kind of talk about your process and like what you did and, you know, how you got connected with college coaches and how you got in front of them. Um, well, uh, back again to my mom. I uh, did a lot of research on volleyball and um, getting connected and how to get like shown in front of colleges. And one of the things she found was um, getting started emailing early. Um, even before um, June fifteenth, I think that's the date where you can your uh, sophomore year, June fifteenth, where you can uh, start talking to coaches. You want to start emailing before them, before then, and that's kind of what we did. So we kind of got on um, some coaches' rosters and not rosters, but on their like lists of like people to look for, um, because not everybody's going to be emailing early. Um, they think you know I'll just email when June fifteenth comes around, but that's not the case. Um, but yeah, I really just started out with emailing and, you know, some, it, it comes slow sometimes and other times it comes really fast. And during the slow times, you just have to remember that like you're not being not seen. Um, sometimes the recruitment is just a slower process than it is a faster process. And I had to remember that a lot because I felt like I was like, okay, nobody's even seeing me. Like, what's the point? I didn't even, I didn't even commit till my senior year. So if you're thinking that it's too late, it's really not. Um, you have time to find your perfect fit, and that's kind of what I had to remember too. So, yeah, I feel like most athletes I know didn't commit until their senior year. I know very few athletes who committed junior year. I mean, you you you're probably if you're committing junior year, you're probably like six five and you're hitting four hundred. <laughs> I, I don't know. I like honestly, most athletes I know who commit. I I even. This past year, I had athletes that I coached. They didn't even commit until like it was like May or April, like which feels so late. But it's like that's not uncommon. Everyone, yeah. there's kind of that pressure, like oh, I got to know by my junior year where I'm going, and you know, so it, it's it, like you said, it's not a, always a fast process. Um, it can be slow there. I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of athletes. I mean, just in the Southern region, there's 10,000 plus athletes, um, just in our region. So, you know, it's a lot. So, um, 
did you touch on any tips for emailing college coaches? I know you talked about emailing early, um, but like, what are you sending? What kind, what, what kind of highlight reels are you sending and how are you putting that together? Um, usually what I sent was just kind of like, you know, my height. Well, actually, no, not my height. Uh, my position, my class, my name. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Uh, my position, my class, my name. And it's kind of important to have some like personality in your email because you don't just want to be like, like every other email they see, which is like, hey, I'm Shay, here's my highlights. They're going to put that in the trash. They're going to be like, okay, we don't care. Um, so you always want to put like a little bit of like piece about yourself, like get to know me, what you like to do, um, your love for volleyball, whatever that may be. Um, and then uh, make sure to send them your club schedule or your school schedule. I don't think a lot of coaches recruit during school season, but – um, I like to send them my club schedule and just be like, hey, I'd love for you to come watch me sometime this year. Even if it's midway through the season, you still want to send them the rest of your tournament schedule. Um, and then just go ahead and uh, tell them you linked your highlight reel below and make sure that's updated. That's a big thing, too. You don't want to have a highlight reel from two seasons ago. Um, make sure it's updated. So, yeah. Yeah. Make sure that they can see that uh, a 5 4 setter can block the front row. At least throw one one block in there. Um, once once you start having conversations with those college coaches, what are those conversations like? What are they asking you about? What do they want to know? I think really their main thing that I got to hear a lot from them was what was I looking for in a college. And mm. that I feel like I heard from pretty much every college coach I spoke to was what I was looking for. Um, which is a big question, and you really want to know, like, that answer. You want to get that ahead of time. And you can even, even like, uh, Google some questions that coaches may ask just to get yourself prepared. That's what I did. I Googled some questions of what coaches may ask, and I just kind of went over them and made some answers in my head and kind of just got prepared for that. But that, I think that was their number one question was what I was looking for. And they do ask a lot of questions, so be prepared. And you don't want to – oh, another thing, if they if you're on a call and they ask you if you have questions, always ask a question. Mm. You don't want to say, no, I'm good, see you later. You always want to ask a question and keep the conversation going. That is a life skill. That that carries on. If you're doing an interviewing for a job, they want you to ask questions too. So this, that's good practice. Uh, if a college coach is asking you if you have any questions – Ask something, you know, anything. <laughs> um, preferably related to volleyball. Um, oh, oh um, I know so many athletes who talk about the struggle of balancing volleyball and schoolwork. What is your process for balancing volleyball in school? Um, honestly, I just try and get as it, – okay, I'll say it, it's really hard. And to even throw in something else, it's even harder to throw in your social life because mm -hmm. volleyball can take a lot of your time and it can take away a lot of things like basketball games, football games, time with friends. Like if you're really involved in your school, um, volleyball and practices can be really tough, like trying to find that balance. Um, and then adding schoolwork in there too just makes it ten times harder. But Usually what I like to do is I just like to get all my work knocked out as much as I can, um, whether that's like doing it early in the morning or doing it late at night. Usually it's late at night because I'm a procrastinator, but that's okay. Um, I just like to get as much done as I can. So that way my social life is important to me. I love my friends. I'm a very people person. And so I love hanging out with them, but I know I can't do anything until I get my schoolwork done. And yeah, I got practice pretty much every day. So I got to find time to like balance all three of those things and you can usually eliminate your schoolwork pretty easily. Yeah. Um, I imagine there are some tournaments where you have to go out of town and maybe you have to leave on a Thursday or a Friday. How do you communicate that with your teachers that, Hey, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be missing two full days or you know something like that. Like, and then I, you have to, I guess, make up your work or get it done early. What is, how's that conversation work? <laughs> Usually I just tell them, um, just like, hey, I'm going to be leaving like Thursday and I won't be back till Monday or whatever. Um, some teachers will give it to you before you leave and expect you to get it done before then. Um, that's why you make sure you give them plenty of time in advance um, for you to tell them. Or others will just say, hey, we'll just catch up when you get back. We'll make up tests or whatever. We'll do your homework when you get back, whatever. Um, and some teachers will send you home with work to do. Um, and sometimes you can get that done on the way to your tournament or at your tournament, your hotels or whatever. Um, usually I try my best to get it done before I leave. So I don't have to stress about that when I get back because I'm going to be exhausted anyways. So, um, yeah, I usually try and get that knocked out pretty early. 
Gotcha. Did any college coaches ever talk to you about the schoolwork and like, here's how we do in college, or uh, did they ask you about your GPA or anything like that? Uh, they definitely do, and they also have your transcript too. Well, I know okay. some of them do. They definitely talk about your grades, and they also ask, a lot of them ask what your major is. And if you're undecided, it's okay, because I've been undecided oh, yeah. for a long time. Yeah. I still don't know. Um, but they, they do ask you about your major. They ask about your GPA and your grades and all that. Um, so it's important to stay on top of those things and not get caught up in your social life or your volleyball life, even though it's fun. you got to focus on school, too, because you can't go to college volleyball without the college part. So. Yep, that's right. They they, you won't get to play very long if you don't do the yeah. school part. Um, and you're absolutely right. No pressure to anyone out there who doesn't know what their major is going to be. I changed three times. I think I started as a theater major. Um, I ended up as an accounting major, which is the complete opposite of theater. Um, but I wanted to do something else, but I didn't like the professor. <laughs> so, so I'm not not a marketing major. Um, I'm an accounting major instead. But yeah, no pressure to know what you want to do right when you get to college. Um, any of you joining us now, we got Shea Britt. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat and we'll be happy to answer those for you. We're only going to be on for a few more minutes. Um, next question, if you could speak to younger athletes who feel the kind of that same pressure and perfectionism that you do, what would you? What advice would you give them about you know the ups and downs and just how to deal with that pressure? Um, honestly, I would just tell them that it's gonna be okay because I feel like in the moment it feels like everything's not gonna be okay. Um, I think it's important for them to know to just take a deep breath and to live in the moment because obviously now being a senior, I wish I could go back and relive all my years of high school volleyball, which sounds so weird. Um, but I wish I could go back in time and just like play one more time um, in front of the crowd or in front of with my teammates. Um, and obviously, I still have college ball to go, but make sure to enjoy the moment. And because it's, you're never going to get it back, all you're going to have is memories left. Um, and make sure to not be so hard on yourself because volleyball is supposed to be fun. And if you're not having fun, then what are you even doing playing? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, it, it, it goes by fast enjoy it um there's nothing like playing for your school uh, just mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a different kind of pride for playing for, with your school and then you're a senior and you're your last you end up playing your last match and there's a brief moment of now what <laughs> even if you do plan on playing in college it's still like it's over like my school season's over what what else is left here um we got just a few more minutes um just double check and make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, is that the same advice that you would give to your younger self? If you could talk to your eighth grade self or seventh, whatever, seventh grade, eighth grade, uh, middle school B team, I can't remember which one it was. Like, is that the same advice you would give yourself um, thinking back to when you were first starting and you felt like you just sucked at volleyball? I would also probably add in there that it's all going to work out and it's all going to work out to the Lord's plan. Follow his steps and keep trusting his. It's hard to see that when you're in the moment and you're struggling, but just I would tell myself to know that it's going to work out in the end, even if you can't see it now. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. All right, as we wrap up here, do you have any last second advice or anything else you want to throw out here to everyone watching? Um, if you do play sport, have fun. It's all about having fun. Um, be mentally tough, as Coach Stewart says. Um, and just play your game. That's all you can do. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you so much, Shay, uh, for joining me tonight. Uh, wonderful conversation. You had such great insight. I know you um, had a, a very, I mean, productive career, young career so far. I know you've learned so much, especially about yourself, you, you know, how to, how to build that mental toughness. You've had great support uh, from your parents, your teammates, and your coaches. And uh, now you're committed to playing college, which is exciting. Um, yeah, if you're not following Shay, follow Shay. She posts a lot of really good content. Sometimes it's her highlights. Sometimes it's her uh, failing. <laughs> and oftentimes she posted a lot of really good stuff on mental toughness and mental skills. And it's all stuff that she uses herself. Um, oh, uh, Avery. Uh, 
I believe oh, it's Shay's dad. Uh, so they're more than happy to help you with your recruiting process. So I guess send the message to Shay, uh, and yeah. she'll help you out. Um, also, if you're not in my broadcast channel, you get a lot of sneak peek stuff on uh, mental coaching that I'm doing. My broadcast channel, go to my profile. It's called Thrive Mindset. Um, I am launching an online course in two weeks teaching mental skills that the elite athletes use. And if you're in my broadcast channel, you have an opportunity to get that whole course for free. It's going to be $49 when I launch it in a couple of weeks. But if you're on the broadcast channel, you can get the whole thing for free. Uh, so, yeah, go to my profile, join my broadcast channel. Shay, thank you so much. Once again, uh, we'll keep in touch, and maybe we can do this again sometime. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. You too.